Okay. I think our numbers are increasing. In the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll get us going. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Levo. I'm the Vice President of People, Culture and Communications. I'm super happy as always to be here uh, playing a moderating role for today's town hall on April the 6th. Uh, we do have a, a packed agenda today and we'll get right to it. Uh, I'll just I'll do a little, little housekeeping. Uh, we will have our question feature open. So if you have uh, questions on any of the topics uh, today or something that was on your mind, you can, you can pose it in the questions uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Please use the uh, questions function for questions and the uh, um, chat function the, uh, for our celebrations at the end. So that's the second order of business. Uh, at the end, we'll pause for some celebrations. So please think of anything that you would wish to remark on, anyone you would wish to celebrate or a team accomplishment or something happening in the environment that you would like to call out, that'd be really appreciated. And uh, I think we'll, with that said, we're ready to rock. So I'll hand things over to our president and CEO, Rob McIsaac. Rob, over to you. Thanks very much, Aaron, and good morning, everybody. And thanks for uh, joining the town hall today. As always, I want to uh, start by acknowledging that we are pr privileged to provide care on lands that Indigenous peoples have called home for thousands of years. We recognize and respect the presence and stewardship of all Indigenous peoples as keepers of this land. So um, today uh, is the last town hall, um, or at least we're not meeting again until May 4th. So. Um, Maybe I'll just go over a few of the uh, significant milestones that we will be observing uh, between now and our next town hall. On April 28th, we are going to acknowledge uh, the day of mourning, which recognizes those who have uh, lost their lives or suffered injury or illness on the job uh, or experienced a work-related uh, tragedy. So that's a real a uh, poignant reminder of uh, the need for all of us to continue to focus on safety in the workplace. Uh, in early May, uh, we will also celebrate our physician colleagues on Doctor's Day, which is taking place on uh, May the 1st. And so uh, we'll um, do a number of things to celebrate uh, that day and the uh, tremendous contribution that physicians make uh, to our workplace uh, and for our, our uh, patients. Uh, then during the week of May 8 to 14, we'll have the opportunity to uh, celebrate uh, our nursing colleagues. Information about these and other observances will uh, also be shared via uh, dispatch and posted on the hub. Um, the next subject I want to address is the outcome of a human rights complaint citing gender discrimination by a former uh, female surgeon uh, and leader here at Hamilton Health Sciences. Uh, you might have read about this relatively recently uh, in the newspaper. Uh, in follow up to the um, uh, reports that I've shared with you previously, uh, I want to let you know that the Human Rights uh, Tribunal of Ontario, the HRTO, recently identified uh, the remedies that HHS. Uh, is to implement in order to um, address a finding of gender discrimination in our organization. So uh, the news around this was kind of came out in two parts. Uh, first of all, was the decision, and then most recently, uh, the uh, remedies associated with that earlier decision. As we have, uh, and I have reported to you previously, work has been underway to develop a plan to address racism, discrimination, and oppression that has been the experience of some individuals uh, at Hamilton Health Sciences. So the remedies that have now been stipulated uh, by the Human Rights Tribunal, uh, in my opinion, are, are aligned with, uh, but also supplement uh, our ongoing efforts to build a safe, inclusive, and equitable culture for our workforce, uh, our patients, their families, and the broader community. Um, the HHS EDI report uh, coming out of the um, uh, President's Task Force and uh, released in the fall of 2022 is also informing this work. Uh, and the plan will be shared with everybody um, later this spring. So there's lots going on. Um, 
the EDI plan is also one of the organizational priorities identified in our corporate strategic uh, plan. Just by way of reminder that the, the strategic plan guides the decisions we make about how we invest our time and resources. Uh, you can uh, always go to the hub to le learn more about the vision and the activities that are un underway uh, in the strategic, uh, pursuant to the strategic plan. Um, but I'll just note that included in our work under the plan are initiatives related to renewing our facilities, uh, to making sure we're taking uh, the most advantage we can of uh, EPIC uh, to help us find uh, ways to stabilize our workforce. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in today's meeting. Um, and we are also trying to um, uh, think about ways that we can uh, impact uh, the consequences of the pandemic, including a plan to, uh, to manage the surgical backlog, uh, which resulted um, after those uh, years of um, uh, pandemic. Updates about those initiatives and others uh, contained in our strategy will continue to be shared at these monthly meetings, but um, as I mentioned before, uh, they're also on the hub and in dispatch. Um, and just before I hand it over to the rest of the panel, I want to acknowledge uh, all those who are supporting uh, the hospital's budget planning for this fiscal year. Uh, so the province has released its budget. Um, uh, but we are still awaiting details about what exactly uh, that means for Hamilton Health Sciences. Uh, we're hoping very much uh, uh, that we will learn more soon. Uh, but in the interim, we are trying to do our best to uh, get ready for what whatever may come in terms of uh, uh, the budget allocation that Hamilton Health Sciences receives so that we can be as uh, thoughtful as possible about uh, how to move forward. So uh, I think that's all I have to say. I'm going to now hand it over to Sharon Pearson, who is going to give you uh, an update on the state of operations here at Hamilton Health Sciences. Thanks very much, everybody. Hi, good morning, everyone, and happy to be here to talk a little bit about how all of our hospital and sites are doing uh, most recently. So you can see our COVID numbers uh, today sitting at 41. So that's significantly below uh, what we would have seen in some of our previous waves. We have less than five patients uh, in the ICU and no active uh, outbreaks currently. So uh, much good news on this slide. And uh, Dominic's going to speak to you in a moment about some of the practice changes that will be associated with uh, these reductions that we're seeing in COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of our occupancy, I wish I could uh, show you some lower numbers. Uh, the pressures at the insights are still quite significant. You can see our occupancy just hovering uh, at 100% as an aggregate across the organizations, a little bit less across the ICUs, but at the acute sites and the post-acute sites, we're still seeing significantly high numbers. I would point out the Mumsy site, uh, we see uh, much more pronounced uh, occupancy numbers within the pediatric uh, population. So those pressures continue uh, and you can see our ALC, it's not the occupancy, but our number uh, as of today is 213 uh, patients. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of how we're doing with respect to our pre-COVID surgical and procedural work, we still are lagging from our pre-COVID volume. So 80 to 85% uh, is where we are at currently, or 85 to 90 rather currently. Uh, and we have that daunting backlog of cases that there's an inordinate amount of work occurring uh, for us to work through this backlog. So some 8,000. And there's a number of initiatives in progress, both for the adults and the pediatric population. Our emergency visits, uh, nothing has changed since we last reported. They remain uh, overall, they're quite stable, a little bit of an increase since January, but nothing significant. And we'll point out the work at the JH. We continue to see uh, significant improvements in our offload uh, times, uh, much associated with some new capacity we were able to introduce at the site over the course of the last year. Uh, so that's uh, very positive news for that site. 
Uh, the ALC volumes, the, so the number is, is reduced, certainly I, I, if um, people would recall, I was reporting numbers close to 300 in the last few meetings, and it is a significant reduction. It still remains uh, quite high and above historical rates, and certainly there's a fair bit of fluidity uh, to these numbers as well. So we know that uh, we may be closer to 250 uh, quite quickly, but a lot of work uh, to manage the ALC volumes. Uh, and in terms of capacity overall, we, st we still are using our unfunded capacity to offset these occupancy pressures. So 70 beds minimally opened every day, uh, many days, often many more than the 70 uh, unfunded beds to manage the volume and the demand that we have. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of some of those actions, these are some of the more intermittent, some of the more sustained strategies that we have in place to try to offset the demand and the supply. So on the supply side, we do use other available capacity like the express units in the PACU, not the most desirable strategies, but what we need to do to offset when we don't have significant uh, bedded capacity and using some of our post-acute beds, uh, such as those at St. Peter's and within regional rehab. Uh, and certainly, as I mentioned, going well beyond the 70 unfunded beds at times if we need to. And uh, we are seeing, as, as you would expect in these situations, significant number of patients waiting in the ICU to move to their lower level of care. And then from a demand side, uh, there's been a significant work done by our surgical procedural partners to move their overnight cases into same day uh, and same day home cases uh, to offset the demands for beds. Uh, we have struggled a bit with surgical cancellations, but a lot of work by the teams to minimize uh, the impacts of any deferrals uh, and uh, closure to non-regional ICU uh, patients, but remaining open and serving our regional uh, responsibilities. Uh, next slide. In terms of some of the strategies, um, there's a fulsome update at the previous meeting from Aaron and Leslie around the HR planning efforts, certainly intensified focus uh, on the highly specialized areas. If we look at perfusion and pathology, for example, uh, where there is significant demand uh, supply issues within these groups. Uh, I mentioned the repatriation protocol at a previous meeting as well. Uh, we are seeing benefits to our organization with greater clarity around this process, uh, and it is helping with the demand at our site. We have seen an increase in length of stay, so the sites are working on how to minimize uh, or, or return to what would be expected uh, length of stay. Um, much of what's attributing to that is higher acuity and to some degree the, the availability of community supports to help uh, with more rapid discharging. Lots of local regional provincial planning that has not changed throughout uh, the pandemic and pre-pandemic. Uh, and lots of work on the emission avoidance strategy. So working with partners like SE Health and Able Living uh, to help expedite patients uh, in the ED, uh, avoid uh, the admissions um, and virtual care models, uh, lots of pilots occurring across the organization as well, really looking to maximize opportunities associated with our uh, digital assets that we have. And post-acute strategies, we have mentioned a number of working groups looking at those difficult um, to place patients, uh, particularly with the shortages we're seeing in community bedded programs and really, again, maximizing uh, the partnerships we do have in post-acute care and sustaining our own uh, very, very impactful hospital to home program that we have. Uh, so lots of work underway to uh, help keep our hospitals uh, and sites flowing. Uh, and with that, I will hand it back over to Aaron. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Sharon, and also to Rob. Uh, so next up on our agenda, we're going to have a little bit of new information about our pandemic measures across all of our uh, facilities. And delivering that update is going to be Susan Cucciarelli, our Director of Health, Safety, and Wellness, along with Dr. Dominic Mertz, our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, Susan, you're on camera, so I assume you're up first. So go ahead, please. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, so as we've just heard from Sharon, and we're, we're pleased to see that trend in COVID patients declining, and so that's sort of painting the picture across uh, the province. That, along with the uh, new Ontario health guidelines, we're able to begin reducing our COVID pressures, our measures rather, related to testing and return to work. So what this means is, uh, as you can see on this slide, and as was communicated last week, um, 
via dispatch and information on the hub is that routine COVID testing related to symptoms or positive contact is no longer required. So as you may recall, the testing center at St. Joe's did close as of March the 31st. And uh, that sort of signaled the change in the requirement for testing. And so that routine testing isn't required. So what this means is that return to work will be based on resolving symptoms. So um, similar to other communicable diseases, we're looking at those symptoms being resolved for a 24 hour period. Um, if there is a fever involved, that must be resolved for 24 hours. And similarly with gastrointestinal symptoms, um, that time period is 48 hours. Again, that's aligned with other uh, communicable diseases and uh, other gather gastrointestinal uh, types of symptoms. So although it's not new, just reinforcing here that rapid testing or PCR testing is not required for return to work. And as I've just mentioned, it will be related to uh, symptoms resolving. So there is a guidance document that this information is uh, is housed on, on the hub. And so I would please ask you to take a look at that if you need further details regarding that. And of course, you can always contact Employee Health Services if you need more information as well. Next slide, please. So given that the return to work is now based on resolving symptoms and there's no longer a specified period of self-isolation time, we're able now to return back to our pre-pandemic sick policies for absences. Um, this means that staff who are normally eligible for HUDIP benefits, so sick pay, will receive regular sick pay. So we'll no longer have coding related to pandemic sick. It will be regular sick. Um, similarly, for those individuals that are not eligible for HUDIP, just as a, a basis of their, um, their status, be it casual, part-time, uh, would no longer be entitled to those sick benefits again, as uh, it relates to all other types of sick absences as well. Um, if the COVID is related to work, so if uh, an individual feels that it is work-related, there's still that opportunity to file a claim with the WSIB. And of course, it's the WSIB who makes that determination as to whether or not COVID is work-related. And also the other opportunity that is still available under the Employment Standards Act is that people are eligible or, or able to apply for an unpaid infectious disease emergency leave. So that's the update on the changes. Again, all of this information is available on the hub. And if you do have questions about your particular symptoms or your situation, um, please contact Employee Health Services and one of our occupational health nurses will assist you with that. Thanks, Erin, back to you. Or perhaps over to Dominic directly. Yeah, I think I can take over yeah. from here. Thanks, Susan. Um, similar to um, what Susan just outlined, um, the changes that I will quickly and very briefly touch on have already been communicated. Um, the first is masking changes as per April the 1st, where we go back to, um, to the masking requirement that we have had end of summer last year which basically is that in specific HHS facilities with no patients, so non-hospital buildings, mass remains mask friendly, but masking is no longer mandatory. Now, this is a first step. You may be aware that there's a new Public Health Ontario guidance document that came out a couple of days ago that gives us leeway to further de-escalate um, masking requirements and we are currently in discussions how that next step will look like and you will hopefully hear sooner rather than later how that next step will uh, be. The second change here is to COVID testing requirements for transfer between facilities. This is to align with the long-term care sector first and foremost where admission testing or transfer testing is now discouraged and we will follow suit that no longer do that routinely for within hospital transfers. This being said, if a receiving facility requests a test, we would obviously still do that, but important in terms of feedback to that facility is they should not be waiting for a negative test. They can ask for a test, we can provide that test, but the transfer should happen regardless. And again, that's in accordance with the guidance that's out there. 
Uh, next slide. Then uh, one change in terms of PPE guidance, which is already in place as well, that for routine, so no non-HMP, so non-aerosol generating medical procedure care of patients who are in additional COVID-19 precautions, either as a suspected or confirmed case, you can now choose whether you want to don a well-fitting medical mask or whether you would like to continue to use an N95 respirator. So it's your choice now, we officially allow you to go back to medical masks if you choose to do so. Uh, the exception to that rule is HEMP care. So for example, a patient on BiPAP or CPAP uh, who's COVID positive, suspected or exposed, we still require fit tested N95 respirator again in keeping with uh, the provincial guidance at this point of time. That's all I had for my end, so handing back to Aaron. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, both Susan and Dominic, uh, for the update today. Uh, and next up on our agenda, we have an update on one of the workforce planning initiatives. So there's an initiative in our corporate strategic plan uh, that uh, I'm co-chairing with Leslie Gillies. And we have one of the five uh, areas of work uh, presenting today. Uh, that is being led by Lara Murphy, our Director of Interprofessional Practice, along with Mark Goral, our Manager of Organizational Development. And this is around orientation and retention. Uh, so Mark and Laura are going to give us a bit of an update around the work underway in that particular program. Uh, so Mark, you're up first and over to you. Thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, so myself and Laura Murphy are the co-leads for orientation and retention, which is one of the programs of work within workforce planning, which, as you can note from this uh, strategic plan slide in the bottom left hand corner, you'll see that HHS does have a number of transformation programs. And these are programs that have the uh, intention of significantly changing the way we do things in the years ahead. And workforce planning is one of those areas. And as noted on the following slide, this work does have five streams. Uh, orientation and retention we'll be speaking about today, but there's also other uh, work underway, including looking at our models of care, enhancing our recruitment and onboarding practices, looking at how we use data and analytics, and how leaders can be supported in leading their teams. And all of these uh, um, areas of work have the potential to impact our health human resources challenges, and all can play a role in impacting retention. And on this next slide, as we look at orientation and retention specifically, the focus of this work is to enhance both the new employee and the student experience to foster commitment from the first day with targeted programming and support. And why are we considering retention as a priority? Um, on the next slide, please. Uh, this work on workforce planning commenced with significant engagement across HHS, as well as in-depth internal and external reviews to identify priorities and retention was identified as a key priority. We do see that HHS loses a disproportionate number of clinical staff in year one of employment, and that heightened risk does continue throughout the first five years. So by impacting, uh, you know, if we are trying to solve our health human resources challenges, we know that recruitment plays a key role, but it's also important to invest in uh, effective and supportive orientations in order to create a, an effective and meaningful orientation experience throughout the first year and setting people up for success in their careers at HHS. And we also know through various sources that staffing challenges do pose great challenges on teams and can affect the individual experience as well as the team uh, experience as well. So as we look to enhance retention, um, we hope that that will also help with our team's experiences overall and that employee experience across the board. Next slide, please. In just a moment, Laura Murphy will share more about the work thus far and the scope of work, but we do want to um, highlight some of the key outcomes which we are seeking to achieve throughout this work. And one outcome is that we do hope to create a positive experience, one in which people do feel valuable and prepared and able and supported to operate effectively within their roles. We're also hoping to create an, uh, a clear understanding of why do people choose to stay at HHS and why do people choose to leave HHS so we can have targeted interventions uh, based on that feedback with an awareness and an emphasis on clinical areas because we do know that, that is the area of greatest need. We, um, also students are just as important in this work and we do wanna look at having, how we can create the student experience to be one that is positive so that students can see HHS as a place to begin their careers after graduating. And also with that would come, uh, our hope would be an increase in number of learner placements across HHS 
more learners uh, here for student placements and more areas accepting student placements. And also as this work continues, we will continue to continue to craft key performance indicators and follow a PDSA cycle throughout all of this improvement work. And at this time, I will turn it over to Lara who will share more about the focus of the work and what's ahead. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. A uh, few pieces really uh, going off of what Mark was speaking about is the question around, well, what's next or where does our work take us? And so some of the priority elements um, and areas that we'll be focusing on is really first, of course, as we spoke about our employees and our learners, um, specifically looking within those clinical areas, noting that we have an expansive range of individuals within our organizations. So the intention of this work is really to ensure that what is created is something that we can modify or expand to other areas as we continue through those cycles of learning. Another piece as Mark had, had highlighted is we're really looking at that first year. So understanding as we have new hires or learners entering our organization, what is that orientation period? What is that, that ability to really become involved and become you know, part of HHS? And what does that impact look like on continuing with the retention of those individuals? We've, we've listed here what you would call new and updated listening practices. And really that comes down to understanding from our people. What are we looking at? How are, how are we uh, supporting you so that you want to stay? And if uh, you are choosing to leave, what does that mean? And how can we address it or support that differently? So looking at how we work through that process. And again, enhancing retention, not only for our, our, our new individuals that are coming on board, but also how do we support our people that have been supporting us and supporting our patients? Next slide, please. So what are there's a few things that we've done so far that we'd like to highlight and just really um, want to recognize. One of the pieces that really falls within the orientation is recognizing we've been through three years of the pandemic and we've had this opportunity to take a lot of feedback and understanding of what's needed within our orientations to date. And so there's been a lot of work um, within the revamping and really the reintroduction of some in-person comprehensive orientations. Specifically in April this, uh, this year, we will be reintroducing our health professional orientation, uh, which is a one-day orientation, which really brings together our regulated and unregulated health professionals into a day of learning. They're going to learn from experts in the field, learn from each other, and what as well learn from our patients. Um, within this realm, there's also work that will be done during that day about talking about least restraints code blue, talking about hand hygiene, and really the elements of interprofessional practice and how we expect them and want them to work together to be able to support our patients. Other key elements around care rounding and how they work together on, on the floor each day will be important. The other comprehensive orientation that is coming back in full force is our nursing orientation, really has been developed around three days of hands-on learning, understanding the policies and procedures associated at HHS, but also really recognizing how are we integrated as a workforce for our in your objectives? How do we prevent the hospital harm? How do we address sepsis, pressure injuries, fall preventions, all within their day and their functioning as a nurse? Um, so really highlighting those elements, as well as, again, um, the pieces around accreditation, infusion pumps, uh, and working together within that team environment. Another piece that has just come about, which we're really excited about, is the opportunity that the Office of Student Affairs works collaboratively with our parking services and have updated our policy and procedures around supporting learners and their parking opportunities. Recognizing this is a big element that to be able to get to work or to get to the area you're learning, you really want to make sure that you're able to secure some parking, get in the door and know where you're going, really eases their mind and creates that really warm and, and, and uh, approachable experience here at HHS. Uh, out in the news this week, as many of you have already seen, um, and under the leadership of uh, Tiffany Edmondson, our manager of uh, the Office of Student Affairs, we have a new partnership with Nipissing University, which is supporting our RPN staff uh, who are looking to advance in their um, academic, academia and working within the blended learning program from an RPN to a BSCN. So really excited about this opportunity. Um, the uh, intake will be taken January 2024, but we'll be having these placement opportunities um, within our field in the fall. I'm really excited about that. And the last but not least, and, and we'll kind of segue into my last slide, is around engagement surveys. So currently we, we've reached out to our learners that we have right now in our doors to understand what was their onboarding like and what does this look like so that we can start to advance and understand their experiences. Next slide, please. 
And so where do we go from here? What are we doing? Uh, so one of the pieces I will say is that we want to hear more from you. And, and really that's our initial next steps is understanding. So as Mark and I kind of work through this, I will be reaching out and understanding what's the current state, appreciating there's many streams associated with orientation, onboarding, what's that experience? So wanting to understand from the individuals um, that experience it from our current learners and our new employees, from individuals that provide these orientations and support them, and from the managers and the frontline staff that are impacted by the people that come through these. We also have a number of data collections that we've been fortunate enough to be able to pull from My Voice Matters survey, as well as other elements um, within our dashboards that can really speak and, and help us understand what's happening within our units. What does this look like around turnover? Um, where are some positive experiences or opportunities? Uh, and looking to understand from our teams what that looks like. So where will that take us in the end? Our intention is then to work, of course, with our teams, our frontline staff, our leaders to co-design this opportunity to make this look different for our new hires and our learners. What will come with that will be this, again, this, this framework, this opportunity to really implement it, as well as be able to strategize and use this in other areas. And really working on not only providing this orientation, but implementing, as we talked about, those listening practices, understanding from our front staff, what frontline staff, what's happening, and how do we help support you so you stay with us and feel connected with HHS. And the last, again, of course, is creating those micro investments. And I would say we, we talk about learners here, but of course, it's anyone walking through our doors and how do we ensure we're continuing. I think that's it for now. Any questions, please reach out uh, to Mark and I. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, thank you both. Excellent uh, representation of the planning to date. And thank you for your leadership on that area for our organization. Uh, next up on our agenda, we have a presentation uh, around uh, Diagnostic Services Central Booking Office from Sarah Jane Adams, who's our Director of Diagnostic Services. Sarah Jane, what do we need to know on this topic? Perfect. Thank you, Erin. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, so I'm going to tell a little story about uh, the Central Booking Office. And many of you, many of you may not know, uh, this office is located across from the Jervinsky, um, across the street on concession. Uh, there's just over a dozen staff in the office, and uh, they book all the outpatient um, bookings for nuclear medicine, uh, diagnostic imaging, and uh, MDU. Um, we're going to focus on MRI, and, and currently we have 16,000 uh, patients booked in to have an MRI. Um, around fall of last year, uh, due to some pressures of the pandemic coupled with, there were some unforeseen circumstances, um, we ended up in a significant booking backlog. So nearly 8,000 patients were waiting to be booked on our MRI and uh, had yet to be uh, to have an appointment. Um, we looked at the data and uh, uh, we were on a trajectory of, of about 20,000 people waiting by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so what did we do about it? If we could get to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we conducted an environmental scan. So we brought together stakeholders. We looked at the data. We tried to figure out how we got into the backlog and how we were going to get ourselves out of it. Um, we certainly partnered with our EPIC team. And, and a thank you to Rania, who spent many hours standing behind our booking clerks trying to tr troubleshoot and figure out how we could do things better and how EPIC could help us. Um, ultimately, we knew that we couldn't get the line down unless we hired additional staff. Um, so we did. We hired additional temporary booking clerks. Um, these clerks came in and they were ready to work and excited to work, uh, but we ran into a number of challenges. Uh, many of them had no booking experiences and they were on a steep learning curve as MRI cases are very complex to book and among the hardest from the booking office. Um, we were also in the middle of epic stabilization, which didn't make things easier. Um, so a couple weeks in, we went back to the data we had been monitoring, and it was telling us that our numbers were going down, uh, but not fast enough. Um, it looks like we wouldn't be caught up for about 72 weeks, which still was um, uh, too far uh, to wait. So we went back to the drawing board. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. 
Uh, we went back to the drawing board and figured out a new solution. And how did we do it? Um, first off, it was our people. We knew that we needed seasoned uh, booking clerks to help us with the MRI um, booking backlog. Um, across DI uh, booking office, there's about two or three clerks in every modality. So for CT, for MR, for ultrasound. Um, we took one clerk out of every modality backfilled them with the temporary booking clerks and sent them over to MR. We had a focus on not all our patients, but in this case, um, a small group had a focus on only our MR patients and getting them booked. Um, and we were using the best expertise out of the office. Education was a huge factor. Uh, there was additional modality training for booking MR. Uh, there was epic training and retraining within the booking office. And there was e evening workshops. So many of these staff worked all day booking MR, uh, walked over to the Jervinsky, went to an evening workshop for a couple hours, went home, spent some time with their family, put the kids to bed, logged back on and started booking MR again. Uh, it really turned into a 24 seven operation. Um, we also had morning huddles uh, and they were they were focused on education and, and booking MR. Communication was key. There was data modeling, which told us how quickly we could get out of the 8,000. And we monitored every day, uh, not only from a, a team productivity perspective, but individual. And there were lots of transparent discussions regarding how to do things better and what everyone needed to learn. And uh, the booking office came up with a real no blame culture. So it really was about coming forward and asking for help and, and not being judged. Um, ultimately, what happened was uh, this was put into place uh, mid-October and the booking office got us caught up on the 8,000 MRs that needed to be booked um, by the beginning of January. Um, so just over two months. And, and this went on through the holiday season. Uh, so we were uh, thrilled that we actually did get caught up in, in two and a half months. And it was really from uh, uh, these three pieces of work that went forward. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So what did we learn? What did we learn from this experience? Data provides clarity. The numbers provided clarity. They defined the problem for us. And they gave us a bit of a roadmap to get to the end result. Communication in a safe environment was key. The no blame culture that the booking office came up with and moved forward with was key to the learning and getting the job done. Um, we bumped into a few walls along the way. We're human, we're not perfect, and our strategy was certainly not perfect. We failed fast, we realized what we had done, we came back to the drawing board and we tried again. And ultimately uh, that led us to our, to our success. Um, last and, uh, of course, of course, most importantly, um, our people were the solution. We talked numbers, we looked at slide decks, we talked strategy. Um, our people did not get us into an 8,000 booking backlog, uh, but they certainly dug us out and they were key to uh, everything uh, that happened in getting through this, uh, this problem. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and here they are. So there's Salman, the booking office manager, and the crew from the booking office. Um, and to the booking office crew, all of you sitting in the, the back corner of that building across the street from Jurovinsky, uh, booking 500 uh, requisitions daily, plus that additional 8,000 over the course of those couple months, uh, we see you. And on behalf of Hamilton Health Sciences and on behalf of our patients, uh, truly a heartfelt thank you uh, for all you do every day and uh, especially for what you did during our backlog. And that's it for me, Erin. I'm going to pass it back to you. Awesome. Thanks very much, Sarah Jane. Really insightful look at the work of one of our teams and uh, congratulations on the accomplishment and thank you. Go out to them. That's a nice uh, Way to segue for sure into our concluding agenda item, as always, is our celebrations. And uh, we'll certainly ask anyone in our viewing audience or in our panelists to either raise your hand and give your shout out live, uh, or uh, you can type it into the chat function and uh, we will read it out on your behalf. Now, I know Bruce is going to go first. He has a visual to accompany his shout out today. So over to you, Bruce. Oh. Thanks very much, uh, Aaron. Uh, yeah, really appreciate the uh, the opportunity and the honor to share a couple of uh, a couple of of celebrations. So, first of all, uh, this month is actually uh, International Autism Awareness Month, and so that's certainly an opportunity to uh, to give kudos to the 
the, uh, the McMaster Children's Hospital, Ron Joyce Children's Health Center, autism services team who, who truly are world leaders in research, in education, and particularly in clinical care, all of clinical care for, uh, for kids and youth and, and their families uh, with, who, are, uh, who are experiencing autism spectrum disorder. Um, I, did, uh, I did want to, uh, as you can see from our picture, I hope. I, I think we've lost your image. We might have to, we might take okay. us a minute, but. Okay, well, well, we might get to that. So I'll just I'll just yeah. highlight that the team is uh, uh, provides care for over a thousand uh, children, youth, and and families uh, just in the Hamilton uh, region every year. Did over uh, over six hundred um, autism uh, spectrum diagnoses through the regional autism uh, ASD uh, diagnostic hub. Um, and, uh, you know, in our, uh, in our uh, new entry to school program, we're supporting, again, over 100 children and families, and they do half day sessions uh, that started in March and will continue uh, throughout the spring and summer to prepare kids coming into, uh, into school next year. And it's certainly uh, exciting every morning at the center when those, uh, those, those kids arrive. The image you're seeing is, uh, is of one of our patients uh, with their artwork uh, that was displayed along with 70 other, 70 plus other pieces of art at the, uh, the annual art auction at the, at the center on, uh, on Monday morning. Raised over a thousand dollars, but in particular, it was a great opportunity for the these, um, these kids to highlight uh, the the work they're doing and uh, the uh, the care and support they receive at uh, at the center. So just wanted to to uh, to highlight and celebrate uh, and thank everyone involved in uh, our autism services. Aaron, if I could, I also wanted to note that uh, that April is uh, is be a donor month, um, and so that provides an opportunity to enhance uh, and raise awareness about the importance of, uh, of tissue and organ donation. So I'll just highlight everyone out there, please don't, uh, don't, don't hesitate to make your, uh, your wishes, your personal wishes known to your uh, family and friends and through the appropriate notification mechanisms. But it's also of course a chance to, uh, to celebrate the expertise and the commitment of, uh, of our teams across HHS uh, but particularly at, uh, at the Hamilton General and McMaster Children's Hospital, all of whom support uh, the gift of donation. So thanks very much, Aaron. Yeah, thanks, Bruce, for highlighting that. Wonderful. Uh, Neil Johnson, you're up next. Go ahead. Hey, Aaron. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just wanted to give a shout out uh, this week um, on April 4th was uh, um, Oncology Nurses Day. And so we had a great time celebrating the contributions of our oncology nurses, both here at the Jurevinsky Hospital and Cancer Center, and, and also at McMaster Children's Hospital. You know, we're very privileged at uh, HHS to have one of the largest adult and pediatric cancer treatment programs uh, in the province. Uh, lots of expert care from uh, all of our team members, but the oncology nurses specifically were called out this week uh, for their contributions. And I know we're really proud of them. Uh, had the chance to meet with a, a number of them, and of course, Aaron team did a great job of highlighting them uh, in our social medias and so forth. Uh, the other thing that was interesting on that day, of course, it was National Caregiver Day as well, too, on that day. So I thought the juxtaposition of both our nursing colleagues and uh, caregivers who provide so much care, obviously, in homes and at patient level um, in, in our community, but also in our own organization was important. So uh, I give those two shout outs, Aaron, and again, just thank our teams for all their work. Amazing. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Leslie Coche, you've got a hand up. What would you like to celebrate today? Good morning. So our, I have a few post-its in my hand, so I don't forget. One, I just want to echo my thanks to um, Sarah and the Diagnostic Imaging Booking Office. Like, fabulous work. And um, really, on behalf of the senior team, just want to add my thanks to Sarah's presentation. Um, next, I just would like to call out that next week, April 9th to the 15th, is National Medi Medical Laboratory uh, Week. And I know there's um, visits planned and some activity planned within the lab program. And just want to thank all those people who are doing all of that work around our um, laboratory testing. So thanks to that team. 
Um, another one um, I would like to call out, um, many people may not be aware of, but HHS has recently sponsored 10 of our own staff to go to school to become trained to be anesthesia assistants. A super valuable role that is going to be really important in helping our anesthesiologists in the work they do every day and providing patient care. Um, as of last week, we, we actually have a total of 12 anesthesia assistant students, learners, who are now working with our teams across areas in periop, cardiac, labor and delivery in the cancer center. So would like to um, ask people if you can find the chance to give them a warm welcome and especially to uh, thank Dr. Valenti, Dr. Nair, and Dr. McFarlane for their work in supporting these people. And Diana Marinowski as the manager, she's got a great big work plan that we're bringing all these people on board. So really important for our um, anesthesia work. And my last one is to acknowledge the operating room teams from the Juravinsky and McMaster. Um, have been awarded from Stryker Canada a sustainability award for environmental excellence. So we're just landing a date for Stryker to come and make a presentation to those teams. Um, this is for their work in sending um, supplies from the operating room out for third party reprocessing to save what goes into our landfill. So really nice that Stryker is giving our teams that acknowledgement. I'm out of post-its. You're so out of post-its. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. And Leslie Gillies, what would you like to celebrate today? Thanks, Aaron. I just want to have a couple of celebrations. Just want to recognize the team that have put so much work and intensive effort into uh, the lower limb preservation program, which is an Ontario health funded program co-led between the Greater Hamilton Health Network and Hamilton Health Science. But there is a multiple number of stakeholders, both hospital, but primarily community. So to our project team here at HHS, Danielle Petricelli, Tina Petrelli, and Dan Van Neen, our uh, physician uh, co-leads, Dr. Fadi Elias and Dr. Tammy Packer, very appreciative uh, of all their support. And we have a couple of very strong uh, community stakeholder physicians as well, Dr. Meyer and Dr. Uh, McKenna. So it's a large team and we're very appreciative uh, of the work that is being done to try and prevent and lower and reduce the number of lower limb amputations related to diabetes um, and vascular disease. Second uh, shout out, there's been a recent voluntary recall of the Medtronic Shiley Trakes and wanted to recognize uh, practice chief Mike Campen all the respiratory therapists, site leads, all the respiratory therapists across the organization who have worked very intensively with management and education and so on uh, to, to um, respond to this recall, um, make sure uh, that our response is patient-centered and safe. There's been a number of uh, communication memos that have come out, but uh, very appreciative of everybody's rapid collective teamwork. Thanks, Aaron. Superb. Deb Bettini, you've got a hand up. What would you like to do to celebrate today? Um, on behalf of the staff scheduling and Kronos Renewal team, we want to thank all of the frontline staff, our leaders, our union partners who have provided feedback to us regarding our current scheduling system. And we want everybody to know that we'll be coming out shortly with sharing um, those results that we've heard from people and getting feedback to make sure we've captured everything that you wanted to say and we will have regular touch points with everybody. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Deb. I see uh, one uh, celebration here typed into our, our Q&A, but is for International uh, Infection Preventionist Day, which is actually tomorrow. Uh, so a shout out to all the infection control practitioners who work hard uh, and effectively during the pandemic and every day to keep the hospital safe. Thank you for your selfless dedication, passion, and daily perseverance to making healthcare safe for everyone. Thank you for calling that out. Also just wanted to note, I think at the top of the Q&A too from Stephanie Rowe, just highlighting that May 5th is Missing Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirited Awareness Day. So I know we called out a, a number of uh, recognition days off the top and we'll have uh, a chance likely to remark on that again closer uh, to the day, but wanted to make sure that that got called out too. And I don't see anything else in our chat forum and I don't see hands up. So Rob, I'm gonna hand it to you for final remarks and see everyone next time. Yeah, uh, not a lot to add. Thanks, Aaron, good job as always. Um, I think the number of thank yous uh, that 
uh, and shout outs that were made really uh, belie uh, the amount of work that's going on in the organization. So as always, um, I want to extend my profound thanks to everybody uh, for working so hard uh, uh, for the benefit of our patients and our community. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I hope everybody uh, um, has a great uh, end of week. We, we're going into a holiday weekend. So uh, for those of you who have some time off, I hope you get some R&R uh, &R and some time with uh, family. Uh, and for those who are working, thanks for uh, keeping the operation up and running. Uh, cheers, everybody, and we'll see you next time, May the 4th.